надо сделать важное лицо, да? Может, вертикально, да? Hello, um, I think uh, we are going to do this. Um, those sitting behind, can you please come forward so that we will have a good shot. We want to see everyone uh, close to the, the panel. And we're starting in two minutes. Please, those sitting behind, Thank you. Thank you. So we are starting. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, colleagues on the mark, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome on behalf of my co-organizers, 
and Zina and Paul of this session and the entire and the entire and to say how grateful we are to you all. Thank you also to all the moderators and the speakers for accepting the invitation to share uh, in the knowledge of digital inclusion and accessibility. The world is undergoing a digital transformation at a very fast rate. Some part of the world are moving very fast. Others are still uh, marking time and lagging behind. Our citizens, I mean all our citizens, need to prepare for the tax ahead. In this new era of digital information and technology, we must ensure that no one is left behind. Uh, so uh, in this digital revolution that is sweeping across the globe. So you are all warmly welcome uh, to this session. And uh, at this moment, I will hand over to the moderators. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'll be one of the co-moderators. So greetings to all of you. I'll turn over to my co-moderator for introduction and then we will uh, begin the program. Good morning, my name is Aldred Jordan uh, from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, it's exciting to be here. We have amazing specialists uh, that is going to uh, just give a brief around uh, digital inclusion and accessibility. Um, and uh, I think that we're going to start right away. We only have 80 minutes, and so we're going to be running a really, really tight schedule um, and then taking questions uh, straight afterwards. Thank you very much. So let me give you a little tip that will be helpful to you. Um, later, after we hear from the experts, we will turn to the audience, both online and offline, and I'm going to turn to our co-moderator, for remote moderation to introduce himself and explain that, but I want to give you a heads up that when we come to the question and answer period, when we conclude the expert speak uh, comments, you will, uh, we will not take comments, we will only take questions from the, all of you guys. Um, you have only a minute to ask your question and the respondents have only 90 seconds to respond so that we can take as many questions as possible. So what we're gonna do is ask you to write your questions out and we're gonna take all the questions on digital ac uh, accessibility and all the questions on digital inclusion and then ask the experts to respond to them so we can get as much uh, interaction and exchange. But that means when you think about a question, write it out and think about it to make sure you can speak it in one minute. And I want to turn to Paul Rooney to introduce the remote moderation concept and your role. Uh, good morning. Uh, we have uh, remote participants and uh, we have the floor open to the present uh, participants and the remote participants. I, I will be monitoring <laughs> who, who, who is connecting online and, and share those questions forward. Thank you. And I guess I should have told Paul this, but don't cheat and pretend to be a remote participant if you're in the room. So we're going to get straight into the digital inclusion part. Um, I'm going to do brief introductions around who's on, on the panel. Uh, starting with Ms. Rubin, uh, she's the Vice President of Tech Attack uh, um, uh, Tech um, uh, 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 in India. Uh, Mr. Charles Shabun, the uh, Executive Director um, uh, for Intellectual Property uh, in Jordan. Uh, Ms. Das, uh, the Director for Public Policy in Facebook, for, for Facebook. Uh, Ms. Natalie, who is the Director for Legal Counsel uh, um, eBay and Mr. Adil Suleiman uh, from the African Union Curve Mission. We are going to then start directly uh, uh, for uh, 
comments um, and a brief presentation from Ms. Rubin, uh, who will uh, start the, the, the conversation. Um, she's the Vice President of uh, Tetra Tech, Tech, and so we will give over to, to her right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I actually just got promoted, so I'm Executive Vice President at Tetra Tech. And um, I'm, we're, I'm based in, in near Washington, D.C. in Arlington, Virginia. Our company is out of California, and we do engineering and consulting work. I lead our international energy practice and recently added internet access to our practice because we realize they go hand in hand. If you think about the last time you used the internet, or you might be using it right now, the one thing you need in addition to your device and that internet connection is electricity. You either had to charge your device or you have it plugged in. And um, electricity and internet go hand in hand. You cannot have the internet without electricity. About a billion people don't have electricity uh, right now. It's, it's a huge number, and if you think four billion people don't have internet access, there's definitely an overlap there, right? If you don't have electricity, you can't, uh, it's almost impossible to have the internet unless you're charging and paying for charges in different locations. So we are working very hard to, to increase electricity and internet access together. We work for clients like the World Bank, USAID, um, doing projects on, on electricity. And what we're finding is that if you do them together at the same time, you save a lot of time and a lot of money. If you imagine you know, putting down fiber optic cables for, for internet access, if you're doing that at the same time you're doing electricity, you save tons of money. Just the digging up and putting down of the road is 90% of the cost of the installation. So just doing it at the same time is huge. Um, it's also better for the environment. You're not, you're not making uh, so much uh, impact on, uh, through construction. So it's, there's a lot you can be doing together. But on the social side, what's really interesting is, you know, we've had electricity. Um, it was invented 140 years ago. And we still have a billion people that don't have it. And why is that? That's not a technological problem. That's a social problem. That's how do we how do we include people in rural areas who are disadvantaged, who don't have as much money, um, or who are p politically in areas that, that don't get attention. All of those challenges with electricity are the same challenges we're, we're seeing with, with the internet. And we can bring those solutions together. Um, so I'm really excited to, to tackle um, these, these issues um, hand in hand. And I look forward to, to working with all of you on them. Thank you so, so much. Um, Charles, uh, we're going to give it up to you now. Thank you. Brief <coughs> comments. Thank you. I'm Charles Shaban. I'm uh, the executive director of Abu Ghazali Intellectual Property, a member of Talal Abu Ghazali organization. Well, uh, and I will be talking about digital inclusion, not about intellectual property. Don't worry. So this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been, um, uh, an old uh, MAG member, just to tell you a little bit about me our, our, my, uh, and our involvement uh, with the IGF. Um, uh, and currently, I'm chairing the Arab MAG, by the way. So, uh, going back to our main subject, so we only have three minutes, as our moderators told us. Um, mainly, I will concentrate on some points related to the digital inclusion. And how we see, I think my colleague just mentioned the rural areas. This is something important, how to reach the rural areas. And as you noticed from the description of our uh, session, there was some questions mentioned and some of them like, for example, will 5G help and so on. Well, in general, I can tell you from experience that um, sometimes you need the wireless to be a solution to reach areas where it's hard. Uh, just recently I heard about some project, I'm sure a lot heard about it, that some rural areas, they are even using the, uh, the frequencies which are not used anymore for the television to transfer internet. So this could be a solution when it's hard to, uh, to extend, let's say, fiber optics and uh, copper lines and uh, much cheaper, of course. Uh, some new technologies we don't have a lot of information yet about because it's not yet there. We heard a lot, we read. Uh, a lot about it like 5G, that is not only a spectrum, it's services included in this new technology. So maybe we can use these new services to reach 
The other issue of when we say digital inclusion, it's not only reaching the areas, it's reaching the people with limited um, uh, accessibility and limited um, knowledge. Some of them even, um, I just heard from our great moderator this morning that 700% is still illiterate even. So this is, this is something we think we need to think about to have a real digital inclusion that people who doesn't know English, for example, maybe they know other languages. Uh, and this is something to mention here too. Um, the, the local language is important on the internet to have more. Uh, as an example, in my region, of course, the Arabic language is still less than 3% of the used on the internet, although it's better than a few years ago. And I'm happy to say, since I'm from Jordan, that 75% of the Arabic contents is mainly from Jordan generated. So th this will help the, um, at least the non-English or French speakers to, for, to reach some more information on the internet. And uh, one last issue I think to mention, so I don't take a lot of time for now, and later we can, uh, we can talk about uh, going to business side. Since I'm a business uh, sector, I think even business, besides the known, of course, role of them in helping and working with ISPs and other uh, internet providers, I think we should have something included in the, uh, even in the HR systems inside the firms to, to let our employees know more, maybe connected to promotion. So even if you want to, you cannot reach another level unless you have a specific level of knowledge, mainly using the internet and online. So I think this is, I will stop here, so leave time for my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Look, I think, I think it's really, really great. If, if there's one thing that was really clear um, at the IGF conference now, was that partnerships are gonna make this work um, and a new way of thinking. Um, we cannot just depend on governance or, or, or governments to make this happen, but a collaborative effort between the private sector, governments, and now with community networks coming about, um, I think that uh, we're gonna make it work. Um, the next speaker that we will have um, is Ms. Dusp, uh, the Director for Public Policy in Facebook. So Ms. Natalie, uh, the Director for Legal Counsel, eBay. Yeah. Hi. Um, for us at eBay, digital and inclusion means using technology to connect um, people and build um, economic opportunity for everyone, everywhere in the world. We believe digital skills and literacy for inclusion can only be addressed collectively, as you said. We need both private and public sectors commitment to support digital development, especially in favor of the economic development. The business of pure online marketplaces like eBay enables the community of entrepreneurs to launch and expand their online presence by offering them the digital skills and tools they need. The online marketplaces business relies only on the success of sellers who trade on their platform to sell their items around the world. To support as much as we can entrepreneurs, eBay has been working quite hard lately on solution to make its platforms more available for all users by among other means, enabling an offline experience for users, particularly those in developing countries who do not have reliable network connectivity. To underline the power of digital skills, I just would like to point out that 99% of our sellers export internationally in more than 23 countries. Online marketplaces are the only representative of their sellers, mainly small and business, medium-sized businesses. Those businesses are just the motor, the essence of the economic growth. The ICT has fully changed 
the retail distribution for very small businesses by allowing them to reach out customers outside of their local communities without having to invest in physical facilities. We strongly believe that the cooperation with public authorities will encourage anyone in the world, regardless their background, gender, identity, or experience to become an online entrepreneur. As said, online marketplaces offer small and medium-sized businesses digital tools that enable them to accelerate their operation at home and abroad. I would like to make a focus on women. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere in the world, the number of women starting and running new businesses is actually growing. Women entrepreneurship rates are higher in countries with lower level of economic development. To support women in this area, eBay, as long as others like I know Facebook, has developed a program named She Trades, which consists in providing onboarding support and regular <coughs> webinar training on key commerce issue. We cannot achieve the digital transformation without the help of public authorities. They also have a major role to play in supporting entrepreneurs towards digital tools. One of the recommendations we have would be to test programs based on the combination of the digital ambassadors and innovative distance learning tools. With that, no company would be discriminated against according to its location and could benefit from inclusion. To conclude, we strongly believe that this issue can only be addressed by a common and joint effort. In that regard, the private and the public sector must work hand in hand, and we are at the disposal of public authorities to collaborate on the digital policies of today and tomorrow in favor of the training and the development of digital skills and literacy for inclusion for entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, take the moderator's prerogative and uh, pose a question to you, which you will have time to think about uh, between now and when we get to the question and answer period. But um, the, uh, uh, this, I think the audience will have other questions, but here's my question. In countries that don't yet have um, roads that are paved in rural parts of the uh, country and that do not have reliable uh, package delivery services or postal delivery services um, or do not have um, 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 the kind of infrastructure that it takes, that it takes to actually deliver uh, goods, uh, can you think a little bit ahead about uh, what kinds of public policies that might be needed to help to uh, also advance that needed infrastructure. Um, so just park that uh, and we'll come to it later. But I cheated because I studied up on some of these problems. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Shall we just turn back for one minute to any of the, the previous speakers and ask if they wanted to make an, an one minute extension to any of their comments? Nomini, Charles? I think Romini. I, I would I would sort of build on on the comment about gender and women. Um, we've seen challenges in, in having women included in, in the internet, um, and and actually the with the number of people getting on the internet increasing, the proportion of women is actually going down. So you have, you have fewer women getting online to the number of men getting online, um, and that's definitely a challenge that we need to work on. I think that. When we think about electricity access, some of the things that we're learning in that can be very much transferred into the, the tech sector. How do you include women? How do you make sure that they have access? 
how do you deal with um, the gender um, issues in the community that are spillover into um, what are the, this, this is the juice of modernity, whether it's electricity or internet, this is, this is access to, to the modern world and, and the future. And um, the way people can control women and keep them from that, it, it completely spills over. So it's something that we, we can handle in both, both areas. Just less than one minute to, to carry on and about women in specific. Uh, I think when we ha include everyone, and especially women, as we said, this is a big chance for any woman around the world, and of course any man, to have the same access. Anyone who, who is in a developed country have the same access. So this is a good chance to create more entrepreneurs, hopefully, and small businesses. And we will find uh, this helps even as our moderator mentioned that it's not only the government role, it's uh, business uh, sector has a role in it, the civil society even. So when we include more women, I'm sure we will find more young, um, new business women. Thank you. So now I'm gonna pose a question for um, these folks to think about between now and then. And here's the question. So in countries where there are not only economic barriers, but social and cultural barriers to women um, being um, expected or even allowed to have access to um, uh, technology and even mobility. Um, and I'll just reference that. Um, I'd like you all to start thinking about, so, uh, and for the audience to start thinking about, do you know of some examples that are working? I see in the audience my dear friend, Mary Aduma uh, from Nigeria, who participated last year at the IGF in a day zero event, uh, examining the challenges for, uh, in social, cultural, religious, and economic barriers for um, women having access online and access to education. So I think there are many experts out there, but for digital inclusion, if we are going to be able to be inclusive of all, uh, as you noted, 50% of the world's population is female. So you have things to think about <laughs> and plan ahead. Uh, we're ready to go to the next question. Uh, before I go to the next uh, speaker, I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Mukta Yadale from the African Union. Thank you for joining the session. Um, and the next speaker will be from the African Union. Um, Adele, the African Union has done great work around this new project called PETA. Um, I'd like for you just to kind of share um, what this uh, digital platform is going to, to basically do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. <clears throat> My name is Adil Suleiman. I'm a senior policy officer with the African Union Commission. Um, for, as a policy developer, I think for us, digital inclusion means that we need to factor in opportunity, access, knowledge, and skill in our policy development. Um, uh, if I can just give you a picture of the situation in Africa in terms of access, uh, it's one third of Africans, ha they have, at best, one third they have access to internet. Uh, internet contribution to the GDP is 1.1%. 60% of our population live in uh, rural area and remote area of, uh, of the continent. Um, the African Union, I think one of the issues that uh, we are facing is, is to do with uh, spectrum. And uh, the African Union has worked hard with our member state on the digital migration from analog uh, to digital television. And uh, we d developed guidelines on that. And beyond that, we went uh, also develop guidelines on how uh, the country can uh, make use of the, the digital dividends uh, following the migration. <coughs> uh, Yes, we, are, we, ha we have a very exciting initiative called BRIDA, which stands for Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa. Uh, this is just an attempt to bridge the dig digital divide on the continent. Uh, 
PRIDA has three component. One component is to do with spectrum harmonization, and this is going to be dealt with uh, ITU, is going to be uh, uh, implementing that aspect of it. It's a, it's a very ambitious, by the way, initiative. It's a $10 million initiative. And uh, it's, uh, it's a collaboration between the African Union Commission and the European Union Commission. Uh, the, the second component is to do with the uh, capacity building for our member states on internet governance. And uh, this is going to be uh, all member states and multi-stakeholder capacity building. Uh, the last component is we are building a digital platform for regulators. This is a going to be one-stop shop for uh, po national policies at the continental level, as well as a harmonization tool for all policies and regulations at the national level. Uh, as I said, we will also have a, a training module on internet governance, uh, uh, DNS, and, and all ICT uh, policies. Uh, uh, we're also going to, this uh, platform is going to incorporate uh, a database, a digital database uh, on ICT, the, st the status of uh, ICT in Africa, and hopefully it's going to be up to date so that uh, regulators can uh, go into the data uh, system and know where we are with standard. Um, and uh, as I said, also we're going to have a harmonization tool for regulations and policies on the continent. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, also another initiative. Uh, we are trying to leverage post office in rural and remote area. These infrastructures exist, but there are two uh, issues uh, facing this instruction. Uh, number one, electricity and connectivity. So what we are doing, we, are, uh, we already have um, a, a draft proposal on that where we are going to do uh, solar, uh, we are going to utilize solar energy for uh, electricity and, and connect uh, those post office uh, the, through, uh, they, and then they become like uh, center, ICT center for e-government services and, uh, and so forth. Uh, I think if, I'm, if I have more time, I, I, I'm out of time. 30 seconds. So I think the, basically these are the two initiatives. We are also working with uh, Internet Society on the uh, community network. We have done, uh, so far we've done good, good job with them and we are trying to, in the, in the near future, we are going to have a, a summit uh, on community networks. It's a global summit on community networks so that we can uh, we see what uh, we can do on community networks to reach those unserved communities. Uh, as well as uh, in the next few weeks, we are doing also uh, uh, a spectrum uh, and uh, workshops on a spectrum, consultation on spectrum with our member states and how we can utilize the digital dividends and also beyond that, uh, what we can do on 5G uh, and, and, and what our strategy when it comes to, to 5G and OTTs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Maryland speaking, what I'd like to do now is move us to <clears throat> our second topic, which is um, digital accessibility. And uh, what I'm, I'm going to do is uh, ask Dr. Azizi, who is the chairman of the Afghanistan Telecommunications Regulatory Authority, to kick this segment off. But I'm also going to ask each of you, in addition to the comments that you're going to make, to take a version of that first question, um, we ask the other speakers to tell us what they thought digital inclusion was. So tell us what you think digital accessibility is, and I'll give you an additional, additional 30 second bonus to do that. <laughs> Uh, good noon, everybody. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to attend the IGF because uh, normally uh, when I go to these events, it's all uh, state uh, 
representatives were speaking. And uh, I feel that I'm brave enough that uh, I'm sitting between uh, 10 people and I'm the only one representing the uh, government. So, um, uh, <laughs> exactly. Now, digital inclusion, uh, we can have uh, many interpretations for that. However, at the end of the day, we will all come uh, to one uh, uh, result that we really want everybody to take advantage of the uh, ICT technologies in order to improve their living conditions. If it is uh, the uh, corporations or it is the civil society or the states, we all believe in the same agenda. Now, one thing as uh, a member of the government, uh, it is very difficult for me to work uh, within the government with the other ministries uh, to uh, promote the idea on why ICTs should be a component in their budgetary affairs. Like my job as a regulator is the normal regulatory uh, framework development, but then at the same time, management of the Universal Services Fund, the spectrum, and above all, the law says that it is the responsibility of the regulator to ensure equitable, universal access to the technology within the country. So, what I have come uh, to know is that it is very important that we educate our counterparts within the government, the different ministers, on the importance of the ICT in terms of the deliveries, that what sort of impact ICT has made elsewhere. We have to repeat ourselves time and again in order to make sure that they understand that, okay, we are talking about improvement of the health services through telemedicine, e-health, and how we are gonna change the behavior of the patients and also the behavior of the uh, professions who are working in this sector. Likewise, it is very important to make it clear to the Ministry of Finance, the Treasury, the uh, Economic Policy Division, that the literature has made it very clear that there is a positive correlation between connectivity, accessibility, and the economic growth, both in terms of the national economic development and then also the per capita economic growth. So, after giving this a brief introduction, what is important for me is that we have to think about the affordability. Because affordability is the cost of access. If we are serious in this business and we want the universal uh, inclusion of all the populations and connecting the next four billion people and connecting the unconnects, then it is very important to see. For me as the uh, policy maker and then also for all the colleagues uh, from uh, their own perspectives that how we can make the uh, services affordable to people because especially coming from an LDC and uh, from a landlocked country it is very important for us so one of the things that is uh, coming to my mind is the infrastructure sharing and the co-location because this could cut the cost of the uh, operators uh, massively. And then within the public sector, we have a number of very small things, but very critical and important ones. Like if my Ministry of Public Works is making the roads, they have to make sure that there is DAX available for the fiber. We already heard from uh, the colleague from Tetra Tech that yes, digging out and then burying the cable is probably 90% of the cost of the infrastructure development when it comes to fiber. So if the DACs are already available, then it means that we have already minimized the cost by 90%. Promotion of the Wi-Fi hotspots. It is immense. Um, I would love if you could give me my last minute when it comes. Please. Great, thank you. So, it is important that we work together. This multi-stakeholder uh, approach needs to be in practice. If I as the government 
do not work with the private sector, we will not gonna achieve anything. Of course, we are the key. However, we can only give the political commitment. We can only make the environment conducive for businesses. The next stage comes to the private sector and then also to the nonprofit sector that they have to play uh, an important role. Business as usual cannot give us the results that we are looking at. We have to be innovative with our policies. Again, I'm talking that not only the states have to be innovative, but then also all the partners need to be innovative with their business models. Sitting at our comfort zones will only make more troubles. Now, specifically, I would like to give one example on the promotion of accessibility in Afghanistan. As part of the universal access, I'm also working with the disabled community of Afghanistan. We have recently established an advisory group. And I can tell you that it is an aspirational group where we have got the representatives of the people with disabilities, the civil society, academia, and then also the government agencies that are relevant to this task. We are not doing much. However, I could see the result that it is absolutely amazing. We are getting aware in regards to the needs of the disabled community in Afghanistan. By the way, almost 3 million people out of 30 million people in Afghanistan are disabled. So, we are very, very hopeful that it will help us with improved policies and it will help us to find out what sort of assistive technologies are available in order to improve the standard of living of these people. The last thing that I would like to mention is that this group has inspired us so much that in our five years strategic plan for the ICT sector, we have got a whole chapter on how ICTs could improve the living standards of the disabled community. Thank you. Well, I have to explain that I am particularly um, uh, partial to um, Afghanistan because I've been um, invited twice to come to the um, IGF Afghanistan and the um, chairman has been especially supportive of um, a very broad and inclusive initiative including participating as part of the with his staff as part of the organizing committee the other representatives some other representatives here as well and just because I get to plug the national um, IGFs Afghanistan IGF is the only IGF that has a kids academy children 6 through 11 and if you think briefing your CEO or your minister is scary try briefing kids 6 through 11 <laughs> I turn it to you to introduce thank you Marilyn um, our next speaker is going to be Ms. Das uh, she is head of public policy at Facebook um, in India uh, you have an exciting space uh, a billion people uh, Facebook has two billion people on uh, in the world um, could you could you share with us your, your, your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. I um, uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, me to the main session. And I am grateful for Marlon's question in terms of reflecting for the first 30 seconds uh, in terms of what I think about um, the topic at hand, which is accessibility. accessibility. And um, uh, to me, it is deeply personal because uh, my nephew is a nonverbal aut autistic child and I've seen um, firsthand uh, the role which technology plays in terms of making sure that uh, I, con I don't consider these to be disabilities, I consider these to be uh, cognitive differences uh, and the role which technology plays in terms of harnessing and enabling uh, that. Uh, and this is, I think, um, more than the activities of any one particular uh, company. Um, I think it's very important for us to wrap our heads around learning needs which people with cognitive differences have. And I think that is um, uh, the central framing which we must uh, consider. 
So <clears throat> that said, I do want to talk about the things which we as a company as Facebook uh, are doing. Uh, we've made huge investments in terms of uh, looking at um, people with uh, hearing impairment, also with uh, a visual impairment and also uh, uh, sort of visual blindness as well. And in doing that, uh, what we have focused on is making investments on video captioning, particularly to address uh, the needs of people with hearing impairment. We've also uh, looked, everybody on this, uh, you know, sort of table and in this forum is aware of the role of screen readers uh, in terms of making sure um, that people with visual impairment have the abilities uh, to engage with different types of content uh, online and also develop skills. And what we have done is uh, working with our engineering uh, uh, employees as well as working with other partners in academic institutions, developed alt automatic alternative text formats which uh, helps people with visual impairment. Uh, in terms of, again, engaging, uh, engaging with important content and also developing life skills. We found um, uh, on the video cap captioning, particularly with people with hearing imp impairment, that to be a very useful, um, useful technology innovation to help people who have these uh, limitations. Um, in addition, like I said, this is beyond um, uh, the capability of, ju it's just not one company's issue. It is a horizontal theme uh, which has to engage a variety of ecosystem stakeholders. Uh, we are uh, proud to support the Teach Access Initiative, which is, uh, as you know, is supported by a variety of firms in the technology sector, as well as uh, it has participation from Stanford, uh, MIT, Georgia Tech. Um, I think as our engineering sciences treat accessibility as a horizontal theme, and this comes into play in terms of the design uh, dynamic, uh, you will see more, uh, more uh, steps being taken by companies, as well as uh, steps being taken by academic institutions and engineering uh, graduates to, uh, create, uh, to create innovations which help um, in mainstreaming some of these cognitive differences which we have in our societies. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Collis uh, from the APC, uh, sharing just a bit about the community networks in South Africa, uh, more importantly, the, the benefits and challenges around setting up. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be speaking at this, at this forum. Um, so far, I haven't heard about the statistics and about what, what's happening. In, and for me, accessibility is actually to be able to access and only in Africa today, there are more than 250 million people that don't have access to basic telephony. There is more than 500 million people that don't have access to mobile broadband. So that's access, access to the signal, not even able to, you know, once they, they have the signal. Those that have the signal, there is around, I mean, in total, there is around 1 billion people that are offline for several reasons. One of those access, another one affordability. The Broadband Commission has set up this target that is people should be able to have to access one gigabyte of data at 2% of their disposable income. On average, in Africa at the moment, to pay one gigabyte, they need to spend 20% of their disposable income, and that's on average. South African countries are very unequal. So imagine what those at the, you know, with low incomes are able to need to, need to spend to, to pay that one gigabyte. In that context, many of the African governments are discussing about the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is about VR, it's about IoT, it's about all these things. How that's gonna contribute to a society that is unconnected, that is unaffordable for many to, to actually use those services? I don't know, I think the focus should be more on extending access and connectivity to, to these areas. A colleague of mine, Peter Bloom, went to the Mobile World Congress and he came back and he said, well, industry is more interested in connecting toilets than in connecting people. 
And that's what's happening. That's what we are seeing happening. Uh, the GSMA released a report last month, two months ago, saying that that the statistics that I was mentioning, they are, not go they are only going to grow by 8% by 2025. So the traditional models are plateauing. The traditional models don't have the solutions to actually connect the unconnected. And we need to, I mean, I'm very happy of everything that the Afghanistan uh, representative said. I, I was very surprised to hear government saying that. We, need to, we definitely need to think outside the box. And one of those outside the box solutions are community networks, are actually communities and groups of people are organizing themselves to actually set up the telecommunications infrastructure that they need to meet their communication needs. And there are several around the world. Yesterday we released a report where 43, with 43 countries uh, explaining these initiatives. Um, and they do GSM networks, they do Wi-Fi networks, they deploy fiber. It's like a whole range, like communities organizing themselves to meet their own issues can actually uh, be very powerful. And actually, as the African Union representative mentioned, it's starting to be recognized. I mean, we are working with the African Union, we are working with the East African community, we are working with the SADC community, and those policymakers and regulators are start to recognize that there is a need for these other models to be uh, understood and to be uh, educated inside their, their policies. Because the policies at the moment are only conducive to traditional models. These other community networks have actually succeeded in spite of any support in the regulatory frameworks, any support from financial instruments. So imagine what could happen if, if there would be more support and more enabling environments. And some of them have been mentioned by the representative from Afghanistan. There are resources that are idle, I mean, from TV white spaces to uh, GSM spectrum to LTE spectrum to ducts to towers to fiber that are, are, are there, are not being shared. What if we think outside this profitable market-driven economy that is failing to connect the unconnected and we start sharing and we start thinking about social development and we start say, st thinking about what does it mean to have 40% of your population unconnected? Where are we going doing that? What type of society are we creating? Can we not do things differently to, to make this happen? So, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have our final speaker uh, from Microsoft, uh, Puni. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. So I am Bumi Durowoju from Microsoft. I'm a senior business development manager, and I do business development both for our emerging markets team, uh, focusing on AI and um, the intelligent cloud. I also do business development work for our affordable access initiative. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and then it will hopefully bring some of my comments into um, context. Um, I'm a mother of four. I have children ranging from 19 to 6. I am a proud West African, West Londoner, as you can hear from the accent. Yes, thank you, Auntie. <laughs> and, um, and my work actually looks at strategic partnerships uh, in the emerging markets. But also while I sit in the UK, I'm also looking at partnerships that have been driven from around Europe into the emerging markets. In this, this charmed world that I live in, I do sit on, uh, in a lot of tables, around a lot of tables. These tables range, and I'll give you a, a day in my life, anything from being in Nigeria and speaking to our regulators to try and get them to do something in a TV white space area from having a meeting with my colleagues in um, the Airband Initiative, where we are really looking to hopefully connect the unconnected and having meetings with um, my colleague here at the, the side. Then also going to Nigeria and driving emerging technologies, technologies that, that are really at the cutting edge, where I can see it's gonna make a real difference to communities and to real countries. And then going home and dealing with my kids and looking at how technology is dealing with them. And finally, from a young, oldish-looking person that you may be looking at, remember the times that I used to speak to my grandma and try to speak to my grandma on the phone, calling somebody, they're running off to go and get her, calling her, she's coming back, she's picking up the phone. To now, 
we're going to Nigeria, going to places in Africa, and people have got three mobile phones in their pockets. And my aunties are asking me to get them an iPad. So this is the world that we're living in while I'm sitting at, in Microsoft. And when we look at really Microsoft mission, which is to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more, the requirement for inclusivity and the requirement for accessibility is clearly obvious. We will not be able to achieve that mission without us looking into what's happening here. And also from the premise, clearly from where I work, I have to believe and I do believe that technology is gonna be the enabler for a bunch of things to go on. We've discussed this now. But in this new world and in the time that we're, we're at now, understanding that technology is not only the enabler, but also technology is something that we just really have to deal with the kid clubs and be really responsible about. Carlos has just mentioned here, really, the fact that we're looking at IoT, we're looking at AI, we're looking at these new technologies, and actually the speed of in innovation is really overtaking the speed of our solutioning. And this is where we need to really start be thinking about. I can be going in and I can be talking about blockchain and I can talk about blockchain and I can talk about agritech and I can talk about connecting everybody. But if we haven't got our policies and if we have not got a speedy conversation to ensure that our regulations are keeping up with the innovation, this divide, this whole beautiful notion of inclusivity and accessibility is gonna be a bit of a pipe dream. So one of the things that I do want to talk about is the speed. And I say that really clearly as somebody who spent a whole year speaking to a regulator, trying to get them to have a particular meeting to pool, to at least discuss the notion of bringing cheap, affordable connectivities into their country. It could not take us one year to pull a meeting. It cannot do that. Wherever I sit, whatever we're talking about, if we're talking about technology, it cannot take one year for an institution to have a meeting, to have the discussion. Also, we're talking about the notion of thinking out of the box. And again, this idea of thinking out of the box, to me, how much have I got? I'm being a good girl here. I can do this. <laughs> Speaking out of the box, to me, is really thinking about the convergence of technologies. Very quickly, here on this table, we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about inclusivity. Let's think about the technologies that are already there for accessibility. We've got CNAI, we've got Soundscape, we've got all these wonderful captioning things. We're talking about those technologies for the use of those with disabilities. However, why can't we use those same technologies for those who have not got the access due to their digital literacy limitations? And these are the kind of things that we have a bunch of people out there thinking about, but they need time, they need resource, they need support. And this is the kind of thing that's gonna accelerate this conversation we need to accelerate. Well, I have good news for the audience. <clears throat> Our experts have been so time efficient that your job now and your opportunity is to start writing down your one minute questions. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm gonna turn to Paul, our third moderator, and ask him if he wants to pose any thought questions to our uh, experts before we move to gathering questions from our audience and remote participants. Paul. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Paul Rowney, for the record. I'd like to pose a question to uh, Mohammed and Adil, if I may. Uh, and you know, one of the big challenges that we face on the continent, I live and work in Africa, it's not technology, it's uh, the regulatory framework. So I'm just posing the question, you know, how do we affect the regulative, regulative changes that we need to bring about digital inclusion in Africa? Uh, we don't, we're, we're not gonna achieve uh, digital inclusion just through 5G, but through community networks, license exempt spectrum, conducive licensing regimes, uh, dynamic spectrum allocation and reallocation uh, and technologies like TV white space. So I pose that question. Thank you. Now the good news is you both get to think about it because we're going to take questions and line them all up. So let's start with questions 
uh, that focus on uh, digital inclusion. And let me mention to you guys that we have a very bright light in front of us and we can't see you. So you have two spirit guides. You have Zena here and you have Wisdom, who I'm going to ask to be in the aisle. Wave your hand and then we'll be able to recognize you. And so that's the, they're just to make sure we see you. So I see one gentleman here. Let me, let me just take a cue. Uh, Mary, I'm not going to make you first. <laughs> I have one, two, three, four, five, six so far. Okay? I hope I remember the order. Let's start with you. And remember, we're just taking questions, and then we're going to group them and answer them. Please. And, Thank you. Thank and you. sorry, please say your name and uh, what, who you're with, if you are with an organization. But it would also be great if you don't mind just telling us what country or region you're from. Thank you. My name is Don Means. I'm representing the Partnership for Public Access to be found at p4pa.net. And um, thank you for prompting uh, a question in the form of a sentence. I've been working on it. <clears throat> uh, would not supporting with USF and spectrum reform the integration of three approaches of one, public access facilities like the world's two million plus libraries as a shared trusted local resource that includes training and support and two, community networks for bottom up uh, wired and wireless infrastructure, and three, even offline internet solutions for the most difficult and remote circumstances, represent a comprehensive strategy that could most economically and equitably connect and enable not only the next billion, but the last billion and the billion in between. I love the question that's definitely going into our report. And we're going to get you an answer. Okay, let's come back over here. Yep. And uh, yes, please. That's me. Yes. Okay. Go Hi, ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is for Ma'am Rubin. Uh, as you know, energy and electricity fall up fall in different authorities in every country, mostly. Uh, and obviously, they design their projects separately. Do you have an example of a country where, all, as you know also, the private sector installs uh, fiber? So do you have an example or a country that they have come together and worked it uh, the way you said it should be, like uh, one time digging and doing the project? Or do you know also of a country who has intervened, the government intervened, and they got their projects together. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have uh, the one with Scott. Thank you. Uh, Fahim Allah uh, representing Afghanistan Telecommunication uh, Regulatory Authority. Uh, my question uh, referred to uh, Mr. Adil Suleiman. Uh, uh, once the digital switch over is uh, uh, completed in Africa, so to which mobile broadband technology the dig digital dividend will be allocated? And the second question is, what is the most used uh, technology for uh, backhaul connectivity in Africa? You may proceed with your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Salaniete uh, Tamaniko Emero, for the record, and uh, I come from Fiji. If I may uh, pose a comment first to uh, Mr. Dr. Azizi from Afghanistan. It was very interesting to see the correlation between uh, Afghanistan, your country, which is a landlocked uh, country, and the small island developing states, particularly the Pacific, the region from which I'm from. Same challenges in terms of. Uh, getting finance to um, getting the ministry of finance to prioritize because it's one thing to have political will from the ict ministerials but to trickle down into actual uh, tangible initiatives that's that's another challenge 
particularly as pertaining to the diverse ministries that exist. The other one was to um, the, the lovely lady from uh, Nigeria, sorry, from West, West Africa slash London, Microsoft. Yes, you were talking about speed. I've been trying to get Microsoft to come to my region, to the, to the Pacific, to uh, do community <laughs> networks. And um, I recognize one of the questions that was put to me was, um, uh, how can you get the regulators to come on board? And so one of the things that I'd like to pose to the moderators, if one of the recommendations that could come out of this particular session is to see how we could synergize this. Um, obviously, there would just be recommendations, but to see how we can communicate to the different stakeholder groups and how we can uh, uh, achieve digital inclusion in this particular area. Thank you, Ms. Cade and Mr. Jordan and uh, Mr. Rani. So we're going over here. Going, we're first of all going to the lady in front. She raised her hand and then to the gentleman behind her. Thank you very much and thank you the presenters and uh, quite interesting um, and um, fulfilling uh, issues raised here. Um, in Nigeria, we held a meeting or uh, an idea for women only and um, it was IGF, women IGF and, in, and uh, digital inclusion. And one of the questions that we were asked was, how can the ICT manufacturers or the businesses introduce devices that the illiterate can use to assess, you access one, not only assessing you, you assess government policies as well, and sell online and also learn because the language is not their own language. So is there any, should it be a, 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 um, a picture or a symbol that will enable them access, not only accessing, they would also sell online. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Abiola Faizi. I'm representing Afghanistan Telecommunication Regulatory Authority. My question refers to the speaker from uh, Africa. Uh, as uh, he mentioned that one third of uh, people in Africa have access to the internet. The main challenge is the spectrum, which is not uh, clear, spectrum clearance. My question is, uh, do you have plan to uh, launch digital broadcasting and what timeline has been uh, anticipated to analog switch off? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Mary Helda Kong and I'm from Uganda. Um, I work with an organization that provides capacity building for women entrepreneurs and women in STEM. Now, I'd like to um, talk about the new wave of, let me call it foolishness, that is spreading across Africa, which is digital taxes. In my country, the government just passed the social media tax that is limiting the number of people that are getting online. First of all, we don't have enough people online. And now with the digital tax, the social media tax, the number of people that are online have actually reduced. I work with entrepreneurs that are trying to make their online businesses thrive. But with this tax, um, the number of their clients have reduced and they cannot do anything. And what are you as, let me call you honorary youth, um, leaders going to do about this because we the youth um, leaders are actually pushing out campaigns and um, trying to fight the government and make them see reason. Thank you so much. So we're going to take three more questions um, and we're going to ask that it's very, very short. So the, the young man. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank My you. name is uh, Vasilis Chrysos. I am from Greece and uh, from uh, sarantaporo.gr community network. When uh, talking about digital inclusion, one cannot separate the cultural aspect of the local communities and um, 
community networks are unique in the way they incorporate cultural aspects uh, into digital inclusion because it's the people themselves who are building the infrastructure and the services and the, and the whole um, uh, technology. So I would like to uh, ask Ms. Ankitas from Facebook, um, how does uh, Facebook take into consideration the cultural aspects of local communities when providing uh, these tools that she described about uh, digital inclusion. Thank you. Merci. Je suis Monsieur uh, Mr. Youssef, Director General for the uh, Council of Ministers of Lebanon. We've been hearing about digital inclusion. And after all these debates and questions, it would appear to be that that's a question only for the poor or the developing countries or societies. But, so we speak a lot about uh, digital inclusion, but what about uh, digital exclusion? And not in the poor countries, but in the rich countries. I live in France, so when I speak about digital exclusion, I'm speaking about countries like France, Switzerland, and the US. If I'm poor, or if I'm unemployed, or if I'm ill-informed, if I'm marginalized, if I am elderly, and I am not used to the internet, in a, a very uh, highly developed society where we speak about e-government, e-commerce, e-public service, e-administration, well, the internet becomes a real barrier. And you're oui, oui. running over your minute. Madam, uh, ma ma Madam uh, please, you're very nice and you're very democratic. But uh, let us have a democratic discussion. You've uh, uh, tended to abuse your situation and ask a lot of questions. I've come from far away. Uh, I like a lot of people to dialogue, not just to ask questions. But let me conclude with a question. Thank you. Uh, it's not just uh, digital inclusion, it's also digital exclusion in the rich countries and even in your country. We're not going to uh, stop progress. We're not going to go backwards, obviously. But my question is the following. Are there m measures to help those people, the unemployed, the elderly, those who are, who are weak, who, uh, who are outcast, uh, for, uh, people for whom the Internet is really a barrier to uh, participation in modern society. If they don't have the economic or financial means, if they don't have a smartphone, thank you. We're going to take our last question from Zina. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Cristian Matthews. I'm from Implantatech from Panama. And as, it, as it's been mentioned, the use of digital technology can contribute for social and economic development, but it should be in a sustainable and inclusive manner. There are gaps in connectivity and e-commerce readiness, which implies that the benefits of digitalization are not equally distributed. This is why a multi-stakeholder dialogue is important. In this sense, I would like to ask the representative of the government which steps your country have Implemented, in, implemented to promote the participation of different communities, the civil societies, academia, etc., in the dialogue to address effectively the different policy issues. Thank you. And I think we have had somebody standing in line quite a long time, a young woman who is over here. Um, can I ask my question? Okay, thank you for the amazing session. Um, you were talking too much about in digital inclusion and digital accessibility, but you didn't talk about autism because I have a sister that she has autism and she used the internet as a way to develop herself. And in as the same way, the internet was in the technology was very important to herself to express, to develop, to go to college, to study, 
it was always a very uh, bad, uh, a very toxic environment for a person in her conditions. So I want to ask about, for all of you, if you have any considerations, what do you think about how can we include these people in a safe environment so they can develop and express themselves without receiving hate speech and cyberbullying or being attacked? So that's my consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I, I think our uh, participant with us from Facebook was actually referring to the kind of cognitive. So here's what I'm going to propose. We do not have any specific requests, but a remote Paul has been very diligent in reminding people. But in order to, we cannot answer all questions, so here's my proposal to the experts. I'd like you each to take two minutes and focus on the questions that were directed to you and that are most pressing. And then, if you will agree, we will pull the other questions out from the report and share them with you. And then we can, if you can quickly write answers, we can actually append your answers to the report. So for, we will gather the questions, you'll have a chance to answer some, you also have people who may be able to catch you in the halls, but then we'll come back to you and ask you to give us short answers in writing that we can attach to the report. Okay? And I'm, since the last question, Anki, if you don't mind, I'm going to pitch to you first, and then we're going to go down the line. Two minutes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Marilyn. I, uh, there were two broad themes that I heard. Um, in terms of local relevance, I think the first point was about local relevance and how usable it is for local communities. So uh, we at Facebook are deeply cognizant of this. Uh, I mean, I speak as a South Asian woman myself. That means that there is a particular cultural context in the way we engage with the internet um, in terms of both the good and the bad. Like that's something which we are fundamentally cognizant about. Uh, we have global teams, uh, both at our headquarters as well as strong field operations, which is representative of the uh, communities that we serve and that our users are from. Uh, a big part in terms of local nuance is linguistic capability. So making our service available in multiple languages is a top priority. For instance, in our region, we have, for, in Afghanistan, for instance, we've created a lot of safety guides and safety material in Pashto, for instance, and we are working with local community groups uh, over there. Similarly, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, there's a huge focus in terms of building local language capability and also availability of the service in local language and working with local input factors such as community groups. The second point which I heard was concern expressed around the broader theme of internet safety. Speaking specifically about Facebook, I can say that we have reporting buttons on every piece of content and we have reviewers, it's a combination of both uh, technical uh, machine-led review and artificial intelligence uh, mechanisms as well as human reviews because tone and nuance is very important when uh, you have uh, content uh, uh, takedown requests which comes to us from two channels, user channels as well as from uh, government uh, law enforcement agencies. And in doing those the human reviews, we do take language capabilities very clearly as an element which we look at. We have community standards where we have clearly specified what kind of speech or expression does not is violating and is, uh, does not have space on our platform. We conduct a lot of safety education summits all around the world, including in our region. We just did a big South Asia summit just like a couple of weeks back where we had our entire South Asia community present uh, in the room and that just gives us a dynamic environment to engage as well as, um, uh, as well as tell our community what their best practices are in terms of keeping yourself safe and also teaching your community. Um, <clears throat> for those who have additional questions, I'd encourage that you look at fb.com slash safety. It has a lot of relevant material. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Natalie. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to answer the question from Marilyn, but I also heard uh, from the audience a suggestion about digital taxis, um, shippings, and um, other buyers that uh, eBay is uh, trying to unlock um, to include everyone. Um, 
So for eBay, definitely the key unlocker would be the harmonization of the regulation and the development of a readable postal infrastructure. By experience, uh, we know that the main barrier for triggering a cross-border trade transaction is definitely customs and, and shipping. Therefore, our suggestion would be that public authorities uh, would need to encourage the development of a readable postal infrastructure, um, easy and accessible um, shipping processes uh, that can be filed uh, by either channel. Um, in the countries you mentioned, uh, Marilyn, we know um, that uh, they use their mobile as their main device to shop online. And, and shipping and, and customs uh, documentation um, should definitely be accessible uh, to be filed uh, <coughs> through mobile devices. A readable uh, postal structure, uh, as Adil uh, Suleiman just mentioned, is, is key. Um, we can offer the best internet access or network. If we do not have the postal network, um, there's definitely no point of trading in line. It would be my end, end of it. Thank you. Adil? Thank you, moderator. You have to stop me because most of the questions are <laughs> <laughs> You have two Adel minutes. Recipe. Okay, so uh, I think at the uh, supply side, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, suggestion that we have to do regulations and taxes and things like that. But uh, the way we see it, I think, is that uh, it has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. I think service providers, government, they have to sit together and solve all these uh, challenges that we are facing, uh, you know, uh, protecting children online, how we go about that. We have a platform for children so that we have more access, people accessing the internet, uh, uh, relevant content to women, farmers, all these communities. So, so the, it has to be a multi-stakeholder approach so that we resolve the issues and then we have more access. Um, uh, the issue with related to regulatory frameworks, uh, I think it's also a multi-stakeholder multi approach and it has to be uh, coordinated between the different actors so that we uh, don't work in silos and we have some policy coherence uh, when it comes to the uh, regulatory framework. Uh, public access facilities, I think we spoke about postal offices. And I think if we, we have, we're gonna have, uh, we are sourcing for front for a pilot uh, project. Uh, two countries, Bay region, uh, total 10 countries uh, successful. We're going to scale it up. And uh, most likely we are going to extend it to libraries uh, as well. So we have a solution for that. Uh, in terms of uh, the question related to uh, issues with road, energy. So we, we do have a program for infrastructure development in Africa called PIDA, uh, which we use integrated approach to infrastructure. So if you are building a road, if you are uh, digging a road, you have to have uh, power lines uh, uh, and also fiber optics along. So it's like a dig one policy that we incorporated. You have five seconds. Uh, hmm? You have five seconds. Five seconds. Yeah. Uh, the issue on the switchover, we are planning to do it in Q2 of 2020. Uh, effective participation, PRIDA uh, talks about, uh, we are going to include, uh, we have, we're gonna have training for multi-stakeholder uh, groups from all member states so that we have more participation in uh, international fora. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Azizi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with the first one that, uh, yes, I do agree that regulations and regulatory frameworks are a problem. Uh, however, uh, when it comes to countries like Afghanistan, we are uh, very open and very receptive uh, towards technologies, uh, and uh, we are very much trying to make the regulations as friendly as uh, possible, and uh, we take a lot of uh, consultations uh, from the uh, different stakeholders uh, to make sure. However, still technology is also a problem for us. So um, the second thing is that the efficient and effective use of the uh, universal service funds and release of uh, motor spectrums, uh, identification of the unlicensed bands, uh, these are uh, 
instrumental uh, for the development of technologies in any country. I do agree with that. Um, in regards to uh, my friend, um, um, comments that uh, Fiji has a problem with the Ministry of Finance, I think we all have that. And we have to understand it also that, okay, uh, the more funds we request, uh, the Ministry of Finance response is that, okay, you have to help me to generate them. So we have to keep a balance somewhere and we have to find that. Uh, in regards to the uh, foolish taxation, I do agree that, again, it is killing the sector. One of the terms that probably I use uh, in every official uh, meetings uh, in my country at the high rank uh, level is that at one day the non uh, sectoral uh, policy makers will kill uh, the ICT sector in Afghanistan. We have achieved a lot, but uh, with stupid taxations, yes, I agree uh, that things will go out of control. Um, uh, to what the comment uh, the friend uh, uh, said uh, from France that digital inclusion and digital exclusion. I think yes. We have to start thinking about it. We cannot ignore it forever. And lastly, uh, what uh, Christina said uh, from Panama, that uh, how do we make sure that we get the input from other stakeholders, in particular we as a government. I can tell you one thing I can be proud of, but I'm not arrogant about that. Probably in the whole world, I'm the only minister ranked uh, professional who has no bodyguards and who has no secretaries. Anyone can knock my door and they can come and can give their input. And lastly, we do have formal consultation processes as well in place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zizi. Uh, Charles, please, thank you. Thank you. I will uh, answer your Marlin original question, which I heard two other questions related to them. I will concentrate on this in my two minutes, please, which is mainly the social and cultural barriers. And someone said we need to take, of course, the cultural aspect and my reply to this, I think it should be through education and awareness in specific, because we need to teach the people what's the benefit. So that when they know the benefit, they concentrate more on the benefits more than what's wrong with, with the connecting to the internet. Because these cultures mainly sometimes they don't want women and even sometimes children and, and even men not to reach web internet because they say they will learn bad things, bad political, bad sexual news, etc. and it's instead of learning. No, but we can learn from them. And I will connect this, to be honest, to Dr. Abdel Minam question about digital exclusion. I think the, the government and the, let's say, the uh, multi-stakeholders, multi not only the government, I don't want to put everything with the government, should reach the areas and even the, the elderly, for example. But at the end, I think it's a self-decision. This is my opinion. That's when you say self-decision, if I don't want to learn, nobody will make me learn. Like the example of the young lady, autism, and she used the internet to learn and help her in, in the different fields. So even if we reach and the people, we give them education awareness, but if the person doesn't want to learn and get into this new age, they will not. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Ms. Rubin. Thank you. Um, one of the questioners um, keyed on this issue with dig ones or build ones, whatever you call it, that you have different ministries in different silos, and how do you get to, to them to talk together? And um, we just cannot let bureaucracy be an excuse for our failure to progress wisely. Um, it is absolutely possible to have the level above the different ministries lead in the coordination. Um, both India and Nigeria have included the Dig Ones idea, the Build Ones idea, and their national broadband policies. It's already underway in the United States, in Arizona, Minnesota, Utah, and San Francisco. Um, in early 2017, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, established an advisory committee to think about how we can do this better in the United States. And um, we are um, really imagining, reimagining how to do dig ones in the U.S. There's legislation moving through on, on how, to, how to better do that in the U.S. From the U.S. perspective, internationally, we have the Digital Gap Act that would make the build ones or dig ones approach be a core part of our international development policy. It's passed the House of Representatives twice, just passed the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and it's waiting passage in the Senate. But it's, it's becoming part of the ethos in, 
in the, our bilateral aid programs to think about how to encourage um, beneficiary countries to do just that. Um, that connects really well with the, the question on gender that, that Marilyn asked, um, which is, is really that none of, this is, none of this progress can be accidental. It has to be really intentional. So if we want to integrate gender, we need to put it into the policy of women at the table at, when we're doing the policy design, doing the pro program design, include gender in the qualitative metrics and in our evaluation plans. And that when we're talking about in increasing internet access, we add the phrase for men and women and children. Thank you, Bumi. Hi, okay, lock to cover, um, but let's, let's try. Um, and again, thank you everybody for those questions. It means you are engaged and listening, which is cool. Um, let me just quickly bounce around some of the points that I, I wanted to make. In terms of the, the comment regarding um, the public access facilities, when there was a, um, a comment about the libraries, um, community access and offline cash, I think those, those um, that whole combination actually will, is powerful. I do believe that there's technology, particularly in terms of the off, offline um, uh, um, problem where we are, looking at, um, we are looking at content on the edge. And when we say content on the edge, we're talking about having offline content um, at the point where there is no connectivity and then really being able to go back online to update and, and, and um, to update that content. So there's a lot of conversations from big companies and, and also from um, smaller um, um, SMEs who are looking at that. And of course, the libraries in terms of um, their digital content, really important. I think there needs to be a conversation between library content and the publishers, but that's another conversation. Um, there was a question about backhaul, and I know it was, um, it was um, directed at somebody else, but in terms of backhaul, um, particularly in Africa, yes, we do have the um, fiber framework. And I know actually there's some conversations about using satellite as backhaul. As we all know, using satellite can be costly and there can be an issue. Carlos is laughing at me right now um, and um, that was really an interesting um, conversation that I had last year and the interesting thing is the cost of satellite they're trying to use technology to bring it down it's not necessarily something that we'll, we we look at we see TV white space as a good a last mile connectivity solution but again I bring that up because I think we all have to be brave to think about all the technologies out there to solve this problem if we just think of one silo technology and spin around that we're looking for we're having issues um, IGF auntie in terms of the um, women and the uh, digital inclusion I think I, I touched upon that and I really want to to double down on this whole idea of really thinking about different ways of bringing the illiterate in using the technology that we already have in place yes absolutely pictorial um, indications sound language all of that we're already using in the accessibility space we should also be bringing that over to people who are not able to read and what have you I've even been starting to look at um, haptics which is really the technology of touch just the, the technology of being able to move stuff around we've got a really great example of be, being our, our connect and and such like so I do feel that technology can fix what technology is broken in a sense so um, also, the, the digital tax, my sister over there in Uganda, keep up the fight, <laughs> keep doing that thing. And I think really in, in that sense, honesty, integrity, and really ethics. And that, I want that to be something that we all should look at. Honesty, integrity, and ethics, and the people who are developing. The countries that we are seeking to aid, the countries that we are seeking to go and make a difference, they have to be really honest about what they're truly trying to achieve. We can go in there every day and try and make a difference. But if we do not have a government who is prepared to honestly sit down at the table and look at the solutions, it, be, it makes the battle really, really difficult. Thank you. The honesty of private companies going into the countries the honesty of people wanting to drive in commercial uh, solutions into the countries. What are your true intentions? So I could go thank on, you, but Bumi. someone's taking me here now. <laughs> but, but, but thank you, and yes, thank you. find me later. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Carlos, final word from you. Hello. Um, just, I'm going to focus on, 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 on regulatory uh, frameworks and, and, and enabling that. This year I've been engaging with 
several of them, more than 20 regulatory agencies in, in Africa. Um, and I think for me the first revelation is how stuck they are into this single paradigm still that mobile network operators are going to be the one, that, existing mobile network operators are going to be the one that are going to connect everyone, where mobile network operators themselves are acknowledging that they are not going to connect everyone. So there is a lot of awareness raising that needs to take place and I think it's acknowledged by them that traditional universal service and access funds strategies are failing. Uh, the moment you start the conversation. Um, now, what do you do from there? I mean, how do you change that paradigm? I, I, I like Adil saying, yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I think we need to, 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 to use precisely the, the spaces that you are opening from the African Union Commission and, and try to, 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 to show that this is a trusted solution from other partners than just civil society or, or some small operators here and there. Uh, so training, awareness, Participating in public submissions, the regulatory frameworks and the policy frameworks get actually a lot of input in these public submissions in the countries that there are. If other models are not put into these submissions, the only contributors are going to be the only ones that are wanting to benefit in a certain way from the telecommunication sector. So we need to participate more in there in order to influence those spaces. But then once those spaces are open, I think constant support is important. I think there are opportunities to, uh, opportunities to do pilots, opportunities to, to actually trust. I mean, I think there is a certain trust on, on est established operators because they deliver on whatever they deliver. So I think there needs to be a trust on, on, on the regulators to, 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 we need to build the trust to them to understand that these models are also delivering, that the, these models are also benefiting the country in many ways, increasing competition and, um, and they are open to do that. So maybe just engaging on that, opening up the opportunity to, to build that trust is, is also important. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to explain what we're going to do in the next two minutes. Um, I would like to see uh, quickly, just by a show of hands, how many of you are new to the IGF and to the IGF website? Okay, I just needed to know if I needed to remind you of something. We transcribe, uh, we caption every session. So even if the transcript is not up immediately, it will be posted as quickly as possible. So when you go back online and you go to the, uh, the website, you'll see in the next few days a posting transcripts available. And that means that you can go back, go online, and read through the entire proceedings. And that's very often a useful resource that not everyone knew, uh, knows about. Um, I made a commitment to all of you that we are going to go through the transcript as the co-moderators, the rapporteur, the organizers, identify the questions, and be able to uh, invite our experts to give us short answers to add to a report. So there will be a meeting report which follows a format which we have to turn in within about 24 hours and then we'll prepare an addendum to, t to try to answer the questions we were not able to get to. Let me turn to my colleague to offer the appreciation. Thank you so much. Uh, from our side, we'd just like to thank the organizers, the uh, IGF for the session. Um, a special thanks to, to uh, each and every speaker um, on this panel. Uh, we appreciate your comments, your inputs, and your recommendations. Um, we also would like to, to thank each and, every, each and uh, every one of you that has made comments, that has raised questions uh, on, on, on the floor, and those that are re remote as well. Um, the um, reporter as well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate everything. Thank you so much. Our meeting is concluded. Thank you for staying over. We'd like to invite uh, Sala as our rapporteur and the three organizers, the panelists, and we'll take a photo here in front of the logo.